Chapter 3 of Intelligence Tests and School Reorganization This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Leon Harvey Chapter 3 Methods of Individual Instruction in the Adjustment Rooms of Los Angeles A. H. Sutherland, Director of Department of Psychology and Educational Research, Los Angeles, California Editor's Introduction Those who are acquainted with Dr. Sutherland's adjustment room work in Los Angeles agree that he has made a contribution of unusual importance. According to the editor's view, its value lies in the demonstration of the fact that much, if not all, of the curriculum material can be so presented as to make possible a thoroughgoing system of individual instruction. It is unfortunate that the space limitations of this chapter are such as to make impossible a detailed presentation of the ingenious project material to which Dr. Sutherland has divided up the Los Angeles course of study. For a satisfactory exposition of his methods, nothing less than a volume would suffice, and it is to be hoped that Dr. Sutherland will soon find the time to prepare such a volume. The reader will inevitably ask why methods which have proved so successful with adjustment cases should not prove equally successful with children in general, and why should they not? At any rate, the experiment ought to be made. Even if Dr. Sutherland's plan should not prove universally applicable, there is one presupposition behind it which deserves the strongest possible emphasis, namely that curriculum material should be thoroughly standardized according to difficulty for the different mental age levels. Lewis Madison Terman Studying the Curriculum from the Standpoint of the Child an unusual opportunity was presented on the occasion of the influenza epidemic in Los Angeles. During this period, a group of teachers assigned to the Department of Psychology undertook a detailed study of types of lessons in grades 1 to 6. The interest then initiated among this group of teachers was sufficient to keep them at work during the next three years. Courses of study of this and other cities were studied and compared when types of lessons were submitted and reviewed with the following question in mind. What is there about this lesson that has proved to be difficult? The teacher has been experienced, had no trouble in finding a wealth of illustration. The questions then asked were, why is it difficult, and how did you succeed in overcoming the difficulty? From these beddings, there has resulted a course of study in minimum essentials, covering grades 1 to 6. Each general topic has been divided into particulars, and each particularly difficult lesson or process has been noted. The department which was just then engaged on the task of reorganizing the ungraded rooms, pursued this problem further. To our purpose, it was found that the course of study must be presented in other terms. No two teachers could agree as to the exact requirements of this course, or of the other courses of study presented. Attempts to define led to illustration. A particular child needed the subject matter in terms of an objective, and to supply the need, the course of study material became far less important than the objectives to which it was applied. The question was asked, why not take these illustrations as typical lessons? When this proposal received assent, another striking fact was apparent, namely that each teacher tended to prepare lessons similar to others of her own production and different from those prepared by any other teacher. Evidently, the children in one classroom are likely to become supersaturated with the methods of one teacher. Would it not be well for each teacher to collect from other teachers samples of their lessons, and thus be able to present other points of view, other methods and other values? These points being agreed to, with the help of the school psychologist, the following analysis were made. 1. The aim or goal of the pupil toward which each lesson seemed to contribute. 2. The mental attitude required of pupil in grasping and applying the concepts involved in the lesson. 3. The variety of mental processes involved, analysing, classifying, generalising, remembering, simplifying, criticising, emphasising, estimating, constructing, predicting. Presenting the curriculum to the child. If it is possible to state the course of study in terms sufficiently clear to be fully comprehended by the teacher, the statement must take the general form of a set of directions as to what the child is to do. When the question of motivation is considered in the same connection, it is only a step to the suggestion that the course of study should be directed to the child instead of 
to the teacher. This suggestion was adopted at once for the special rooms, and later the form was used by the superintendent of schools in the new course of study for the city. Principles of Grouping Subjects and Topics Questions as to the difference between preliminary studies such as phonics, drill subjects such as number combinations, and content subjects such as history were thoughtfully considered and the following conclusions arrived at. 1. Reading is the fundamental subject. All content subjects must be read. The difference between preliminary reading, reading for reading's sake, reading for literary values, reading for information, and reading for discipline is chiefly in the direction of attention and the mental activity. The reading of arithmetic, problems, which occasions so much difficulty, is after all reading. And in a general way, this process may be classified as receptive, due regard being given to the fact that every act of reception is an action and therefore an expression. 2. On the other hand, the expression of thoughts orally and in writing is psychologically of importance equal to reading. Penmanship, spelling, familiarity with sentence structure, language, and composition are intended to function automatically in the expression of ideas, and must therefore be exercised in this relationship. Written expression is the name given to this part of our modified course of study. 3. Number work of the formal sort is provided for by such devices as those of Cortis and Studebaker. Pupils who have special needs for such drills apart from reading and organising of numerical values of problems can receive it. Samples of Curriculum Material The minimum essentials of the course of study are now divided into projects, each with a definite objective and directions which will set the pupil into mental activity under the control of the latitude. For each such project, there is a project test, which serves for purposes of placement of pupils on entering the special room. For each project, there is a group of practice exercises, which are sample lessons in the form which will require mental activity of a particular sort, as enumerated above. The projects of the following list are worked out in detail for each grade, for two levels in each grade, and for a variety of applications at each level. Reading Projects a. How many numbers can you identify, find, per minute? B. How many numbers can you pronounce, say, per minute? C. How many words can you identify, find, per minute? D. How many words can you pronounce, say, per minute? E. How many words, in sentences, can you read per minute? F. How much of what you read can you repeat? G. How well can you follow directions? H. How many numbers can you evaluate per minute? I. How well can you define words? J. How well do you understand what you read? K. How much of what you have studied can you remember? L. How well can you read maps and tables? On the following page is a sample of project test, reading test J, level 6, part 1 for upper third grade. In the left margin, the mental processes which that part of the test is supposed to call forth are noted. Reading Test J, Level 6, Part 1 Project, Reading Comprehension Name, Date, School There's a box displayed on the page as well with score. The time in not over 15 minutes and comprehension. How much do you know about what you read? A. Finish these sentences. 1. Ink is darker than blank. 2. Is the baby awake or blank? 3. They play all day and sleep all blank. 4. Her dress was new, but now it is blank. 5. The sand was not wet, but blank. 6. Don't play with eggs because blank. 7. When you paint a picture, the things you need are blank. B. Draw lines from the word cat to all the things that cats do. Draw lines from the word dog to all the things that dogs do. A break in the page has three columns. One with cat, one with bark, eight, mew, scratch, purr, growl, and one with dog. 
c read this to yourself and then follow the directions on the other side of this page john and his dog stood under a large pine tree at the edge of the rocky cliff below the noisy waves were breaking against the rocks it made john laugh to hear the dog bark back at them hearing a ship horn john looked out to sea a fishing boat was coming in as it came nearer john could see the fishermen in the bright sweaters and the big nets full of fish tell the things you saw tell the sounds you heard d finish these sentences one fish have fins where birds have blank two fish swim while kittens blank three we use fish to blank we use shoes to wear four a fish in a net is like a fox in a blank reading test level j part two a score box is displayed with time this says one minute read each of these examples tell how you would do them in a line after each example write addition subtraction multiply or division one there are forty eight seats in the car how many seats are there in six cars of the same size two four hundred and thirty two eggs are to be put into three crates how many eggs will there be in each crate three if four runabouts cost four hundred eighty five dollars what will three of them cost four on a cattle ranch there were six hundred and seventy three thousand four hundred and fifty cattle because there was no rain ninety two thousand three hundred and eighty five died how many were left the following is a sample of practice exercise at the same level for one of the comprehension projects there are fifty of these practice exercises at this level for this particular project robinson caruso chapter fourteen reading level six exercise number forty how well do you understand what you read reading level six j read chapter fourteen and time yourself on this exercise one change these sentences so that they tell the truth robertson used his first canoe for his trip robertson was soon out of sight of land robertson could not find a sheltered place to land two from trip draw a line to everything that robertson took with him on his trip three columns go across the page the first with umbrella fishing rod canteen gun powder the second with trip the third with hoe rice blankets bread looking glass three fill the blanks a steamer is larger than a blank just as a blank is larger than a baseball it is easier to paddle when the sea is blank than when it is rough a current moving through the blank is like a wind blowing through the air four underline the things which help robertson get back to land a wind his sail his gun his paddle the clear water his muscles a score box is displayed on the page with time and the number right five draw a picture of robinson's boat as you think it must have looked or the island as it must have looked from his boat six imagine you are robinson out at sea this is what you are saying as the current carries you away for each blank put a word that means you robinson's lament help help blank i'm drifting out to sea blank call there's none to answer blank o oh, little home where blank was safe and well o oh, little island what a magic spell there falls upon blank as blank torn away helpless alone upon the ocean gray how do you feel as you said this the adjustment room individual differences in physical and mental endowment in home and neighborhood environment in home encouragement and restraint and an ability to make satisfactory school progress under average conditions all these theoretically receive recognition but unfortunately helpful detailed instructions for modifying the curriculum so as to adjust it to such differences are too often lacking in many school systems so-called ungraded rooms have been provided 
with a teacher in charge who has received training which fits her to administer the course of study only in the usual way the consequence has been that the ungraded room instead of giving an exceptional opportunity to pupils has too often become a threat a punishment a catch-all for school problems and a dumping ground the adjustment room is different imagine a room in which the children are not sitting in prim rows or in good order where each child is recognized as an individual who is there for a purpose and who is so busy in developing his own ideas along the lines of the above described course of study that he feels perfectly free to walk ask or receive help from another child consult the teacher or refer to the list of projects which stretch before him imagine a room in which the pupils do most of the correcting and marking and in which the teacher spends most of the time in encouraging explaining and restraining when needs be instead of hearing recitations and disciplining pupils imagine a room in which the pupils grade themselves make their own daily programs and keep graphs of daily progress where the standard performance required is one hundred per cent as to quality instead of seventy per cent and where the standard score as to accuracy and speed of work is also required such a condition obtains in the upper adjustment room grades four to six and in the primary adjustment room grades one to three so far as the number of second and third grade pupils will permit it is usually true that no two children are working at the same level indeed it is soon found that if two children are started at the same level they will very soon cease to remain so selecting the pupils for an adjustment room the test of efficient schools is a demonstration of the development of all the abilities which each child possesses when any child has attracted attention by his failures and is referred to the psychologist he is examined not to justify the judgment of the teacher but to determine wherein his strengths and weaknesses lie mental and educational surveys help to direct attention to the conditions existing in any room and are valuable also in pointing out particular children who need help but it is frequently found that the child who fails on a group test is considered a very satisfactory scholar the reverse is also true individual examinations both mental and educational often reveal particular difficulties or complete lack of ability in a child who is rated as satisfactory such children as well as misfits are placed upon the waiting list of the adjustment room the training of the child the first step in the training of a child to become independent to fix his mind upon a definite goal and to work for achievement is finding his actual level of development this is done by placement tests the real cause of failure of the child may lie far below his present level the placement test is simply an individual examination in school subject matter supplemented by questions or other devices to demonstrate the child's understanding speed and accuracy tests in subject matter also are used and the performance compared with standard achievements owing to the number of such children to be examined a mental test is given only when its need seems to be evident when a teacher has become sufficiently familiar with her task and is accredited she takes charge of the testing and in such rooms every child receives a mental test teaching the child to use the materials after being placed each child knows the number of the project in reading number and written expression at which he is to begin his progress he is shown how to select for each subject the practice exercises which have been prescribed for him and how to take them to his seat and work upon them until he feels he has mastered them he times himself or as some other child time him if the nature of the practice is such as to require it he may ask some child who is farther advanced to assist in checking his work in the self-scoring exercises when he feels he is ready for a test he goes to the teacher for a project test if that is satisfactorily completed he takes from his folder a progress card on which he records the date at which he passes that particular project he then goes to the cabinet for the next group of exercises making his daily program from a list of activities on the board each child makes his own daily program which is scrutinized from time to time by the teacher if he is particularly weak in number combinations he will devote a larger amount of time to that subject if he is weak in arithmetical reading he can secure an extra amount of practice in that field but each child's program will include some study in each branch 
Class exercises. Each teacher has been encouraged to modify her daily program to suit the needs of the children. She is urged to devote at least one-fourth of the day to group exercises, such as group speed practice in arithmetic, oral English, etc. Aside from this, the child spends his time in supervised study. Instead of spending one-twentieth of the time, in a class of twenty, in recitation and nineteen-twentieths of the time in attending or not attending to what is going on in the class, he spends twenty-twentieths of his time in an active effort to improve upon his record of yesterday. He competes against himself instead of against some other child of superior or inferior mentality. He has an opportunity to create a mental environment of his own, mental habits and attitudes of his own, and is held back by no one else. He is at all times working for a definite goal which is within his comprehension. He secures an immediate reward for increased ability in his satisfaction upon recording another step of progress. Some teachers have the pupils keep this record in coloured crayons on the board. As an observation room, under such conditions it is at once possible to note the laggard, to detect particular kinds of difficulty, to watch the different varieties of temperament, and to discover the presence of many hidden factors which deter the pupil. Physical handicaps, ranging from weak eyes to bad habits of respiration, to constitutional weakness and inferiority, soon come to the surface. While an effort is made to keep from the room all children who show evidence of serious physical disability or feeble-mindedness, the room has been used as a place in which any child can try himself out when there is any doubt of his ability. Children believed to be feeble-minded by both teachers and parents have proved not to be so. There is a constancy about the conditions which makes it easy to judge of the real abilities of the children in contrast with the reliable conditions and the lack of personal contacts in the ordinary classroom. As a room for educational therapeutics. Diagnosis is half the cure. The mind which is unfolding its abilities naturally and fully is rare. As the results given later will show, the child who is backward or a misfit, provided he is not clearly feeble-minded, can often make rapid progress when he is given proper incentives and shown the way. More frequently, than any other cause, a lack of confidence is at the root of the child's difficulties, by proving to himself that he can do the thing he was afraid of. Often, by beginning at a lower and easier level, he gains confidence. Such fear attitudes are often inculcated by the parents and sometimes by teachers. Witness the mother who reiterates regarding her child's difficulty at arithmetic. Why, I never was able to do arithmetic myself, so my child comes by it naturally. Wandering attention and inability to concentrate are frequent causes of school failure. A child who is running in the 25-yard dash has no difficulty in concentration. Neither is a child who is working at a speed exercise. The habit of concentration can be formed by repetition, just as any other habit. Lack of the necessary knowledge prerequisites has accounted for numerous failures. The adjustment rooms have frequently been criticised for placing a child too low in order to make a record. The fact that a child has been over the subject guarantees no mastery of it. To develop independence by self-help, it is necessary that all such weaknesses be eradicated. Wrong attitudes toward work, such as laziness, don't like the teacher, etc., have been overcome in all but a very few cases. The motivations are such as grip children of the earlier years. There is an objectivity about the work which brings the teacher and pupil to the same point of view, and the pupil soon begins to view the teacher as a helper and not a critic. The Adjustment Room Teacher Many teachers will not care for the methods of the adjustment room. There is nothing routine about it. Also, everything done must be registered in some way. The teacher who likes to hang on to the bright pupils because they are such a joy will be disappointed. The teacher who just hates to teach dull pupils will be equally aggrieved. The teacher who has learned by years of unfortunate experience to love the prim and orderly rows of dear ones, who whisper not, neither do they chew paper wads, and who are taught at great pains to stand just so and to hold the book at the proper level in the left hand, finds no good opportunity for the expression of her talents. The teacher of the adjustment room must be specially trained not to occupy the centre of the stage, not to gather a family around her and entertain them, not to coach, not to perform tasks for the pupils, 
not to occupy the time of the pupils with her own ideas on the contrary she must have full and free opportunity to devote herself to the discovery of particular educational and mental needs of the children and to use her best judgment in the adaptation of school materials or in the invention of others to the satisfaction of those needs training the adjustment room teacher certificated teachers graduates of a normal school or college must learn how to make the group and individual tests how to interpret them and how they are standardized they must also study the course of study and determine why each part and lesson of it has a function and just what its objective is they must think of it as far as possible in terms of a child mind which is developing with an increasing self-control they must learn the technique of teaching under the controlling thought that the pupil should learn and not be developed function of the department of psychology and educational research teachers who are allowed to the department make waiting lists from which principals transfer the pupils to the adjustment rooms these teachers conduct educational and mental surveys and follow these by individual examinations they assist the adjustment room teacher in making special studies of difficult cases and by their wider range of experience and opportunity for comparisons are often able to give valuable advice as to methods of saving time and energy they are helping teachers the department also maintains a clerical staff for the standardization of the tests and setting of performance standards results in terms of school progress the los angeles schools now maintain fifty two adjustment rooms and twenty six development rooms for feeble-minded over three thousand pupils have been enrolled in the adjustment rooms during the past two years of the first two hundred pupils the following figures will show something of the progress made by these pupils who previously were considered misfits in the grades five per cent were returned to the grade after a short trial in most of these the difficulty had been poor sight absence or ill health two and a half per cent were recommended to a development room as feeble-minded ninety two and a half per cent were given instruction in the adjustment rooms for a period of time and then recommended to a grade median time in the room thirteen weeks median rate of progress four point thirty five weeks work covered per week to discover to what extent the weakness or backwardness had been corrected permanently a report was asked as to the success of each child in the grade to which he had been sent at the end of three months it was found that thirty and a half per cent could not be traced but of the remainder ninety point four per cent were reported satisfactorily prepared and making good progress of the next five hundred children two and a half per cent were returned to grade the difficulty having been due to ill health or absence four per cent were recommended to development rooms feeble-minded for the remainder median time in room eleven weeks median rate of progress four point three weeks work per week a third of these could not be traced at the end of three months and of the remainder ninety three point four per cent were reported as satisfactorily prepared and making good progress in another district of the city three hundred children are recorded as follows one point two per cent were returned to grade nineteen per cent were recommended to development rooms feeble-minded for the remainder median time in room ten weeks median rate of progress four weeks work per week at the end of three months nineteen per cent could not be traced and of the remainder ninety four point five per cent were reported as satisfactorily prepared and making good progress results in character formation a member of the board of education visited an adjustment room in a certain district where the boys and girls of the room were for the most part juvenile court cases he quoted one of the members of the class as follows all gone cut it out i've only got three minutes till the bell rings and i've got to finish this project there are some elements of character which present tests do not attempt to touch those who are in most intimate contact with the adjustment rooms are convinced that a new sense of values comes out strongly in the boys and girls who are forming habits and attitudes under these conditions is it too much to hope that when teachers become expert in the diagnosis and treatment of particular mental conditions the dependent may become independent the erratic may learn self-control the thoughtless may learn self-criticism the slovenly of thought may become definite and 
the careless learn self-correction, and those who lack initiative learn to attack new problems with vigour. And the best of it is that the pupils know what is happening to them, as one boy put it. Gee, my teacher won't know me when I go back to the grades. The Los Angeles Adjustment Plan in Rural and Village Schools from April to June 1920, the Los Angeles Adjustment Plan was given a trial in four one-room schools and one three-room school in Placer County, California. The experiment was made at the suggestion of Dr. Margaret S. McNaught, State Commissioner of Elementary Schools, was financed by the California State Board of Education, and was carried out by Miss Maud Whitecock of the Los Angeles City Schools, Miss Irene Burns, Superintendent of the Placer County Schools, and the teachers in the schools chosen cooperated in the experiment. All the actual instruction involved in the experiment was carried out by the regular teachers with no help except in the three-room school, where a cadet teacher from San Francisco State Normal School assisted for a few weeks. With the help of tests and the teachers' records on quality of school work, the pupils in each school who were behind in their studies were temporarily withdrawn from their regular class work in some cases from part of it, in other cases from all of it, and were given the Los Angeles project materials for self-instruction in the various subjects in which they were most deficient. All the pupils took to these materials with great zest, and most of them developed an entirely new attitude towards their studies. One boy, thought by his teacher to be a defective, proved to have an IQ of 107. This boy, who was exceedingly sensitive, shy, and lacking in self-confidence, made a gain of three terms in his oral reading. Standard tests, given at the close of the experiment, showed that surprisingly great progress had been made by nearly all the pupils. The following excerpts from the reports made by the regular class teachers speak for themselves. D has been in the sixth grade for three years, and has always caused his teacher a great deal of trouble. After the first day under the adjustment plan, he was so interested that if anyone tried to get him to do things in the old way he would pay no attention he was anxious to see how many squares he could fill in every day in the progress sheets n d the enthusiasm with which the pupils approach each new step makes the work a pleasure to the teacher and causes the child to progress more rapidly so far there have been no problems in discipline as each child is too busy and too interested to make mischief it is quite common for a child to remark upon how quickly the time passes or to show regret when recess or closing time prevents him from completing a project or taking up a new one. Interest in the work increased, rather than diminished, as the experiment proceeded. The pupils seemed to derive more pleasure in proportion to the amount of work they accomplished. They themselves made the request that they be allowed to work the last morning of school instead of having stories, so that they might have more to show on their record sheets. Nearly all were anxious to know if the work was to be continued next year, and if they might be allowed to take it. MHT Some advantages of the adjustment plan are 1. Each pupil progresses at his own rate according to his ability. 2. The definiteness of the outlines enables the pupil to proceed without losing time waiting for assignments. 3. Pupils are taught to understand the use of graphs in keeping records of work accomplished. 4. The pupils learn to rely upon themselves instead of upon the teacher or classmates. A. L. I wish we might have had the work earlier in the year, for it is an excellent plan for rural schools. It gives such a thorough drill in the essentials and eliminates so much of the less necessary work that we are apt to spend so much time on. It dispenses with so many nasty recitations and helps a child to do independent work. The idea of being able to advance independently seemed to appeal to these children, and they all asked that they were to have the work next year. M.B.H. All the teachers in their official report on the success of the experiment rendered judgments fully as favourable as those quoted above, and the value of the adjustment plan in small rural schools seem to have been demonstrated. This is hardly surprising, since it is precisely the one-room school enrolling all the grades that has the greatest needs for methods of individual instruction. End of chapter 3 of Intelligence Tests and School Reorganization
Chapter 4 of Intelligence Tests and School Reorganization. Edited by Lewis Terman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Leon Harvey. Chapter 4 The Conservation of Talent. Raymond Hugh Franzen, Director of Educational Research, Des Moines, Iowa. Editor's Introduction Dr. Franzen's chapter will serve to remind the reader of the highly important fact that intelligence tests and educational tests should go hand in hand. Although this fact is taken for granted by educational psychologists, it is likely to be overlooked by the rank and file of educational practitioners. Dr. Franzen has made up an important contribution in suggesting a practical method of combining the results of mental and educational tests by the use of the accomplishment ratio previously called the accomplishment quotient we predict that the accomplishment ratio will become widely known and extensively used lewis madison terman mental investment and social dividends educational reorganization is everywhere aiming at such a classification of pupils as will reduce the individual differences of product to the inherited basis of these differences we have been prodigal of the genius of our race our educational institutions and our methods of selection for important positions in the business and professional life of the country have proceeded in a haphazard way though the conditions making for success have been rigorous enough to ensure that in the main our leaders were the upper half of humanity in intelligence or the top quarter perhaps the methods were so crude that the top quarter of humanity has not yielded what it could for every genius who has achieved in proportion to his capacity probably two or more have been wasted education is partially responsible for methods of education should include the selection and special treatment of supernormal children deviates in intelligence in either direction from the mean are equally out of place in a normal classroom yet although much work has been done in the segregation and special treatment of subnormal children little of any consideration has been given the problem of the supernormal nature has made lavish investments in some nervous systems investments which have never yielded proportional social dividends a plea for the recognition of the varying rates at which children progress through their school life should include a practical plan by which children may be classified a consideration of the inherited and environmental factors which are the causative correlates and proof that when exactly classified children do better work than when more roughly graded it is easy to reason that brilliant children when in an ordinary class so easily achieve satisfactory records that indolence and bad conduct become resultant habits it is easy to argue that children taught in a class in which all are of the same mental ability stimulate each other to more give and take excite less envy and feeling of inferiority and become more confident ambitious and intellectually courageous but it is more necessary to show that children when so classified learn to read write and spell better that they achieve more nearly what they are fitted by nature to do the extent to which children achieve what they are mentally capable of can be measured and we can give a verdict as to how far the scheme of classification on the basis of such measurement as we now have is practicable scientific questions involved it is when viewing the matter from a scientific angle in an attempt to gain exact evidence that vexatious questions interrupt an otherwise smooth propaganda we must know one what tests to use to classify two how to use them three whether abilities in reading spelling and arithmetic or their predisposition exist as special abilities or whether children differ in these simply because of their innate differences of intelligence four whether individual differences in ambition interest and industry in so far as they influence the accomplishment are due to special tendencies or whether they are learned manifestations of a more general heritage five how these proclivities specific or general are related to intelligence points one and two are methods of procedure that must be evolved from our existent knowledge of measurements and statistics points three four and five are problems which must be solved from the evidence resulting from an experiment in classification using these methods 
points four and five introduce the vexed question of whether there is a general factor making for disparity in school product or some general cause other than intelligence should reading ability prove to be the result of certain inherited abilities or predisposition to abilities we could not use a measure of mental ability alone as the guide to what a child could attain in reading if intelligence however were the only inherited prognostic factor of school achievement we could mark the education which had factioned in the child's life by the percentage which the actual accomplishment of the child was of the maximum accomplishment of which he was capable at that stage of his mental development so too if interest and ambition are not mainly the result of rewards and punishments of early life but of themselves significantly rooted in the nature of the child we could not condemn or commend curricula and methods upon a basis of the ratio of results accomplishment to mental ability but must include a measure of this potentiality the practical queries whether or not a child can do reading as well as he does arithmetic whether his ambition and his honesty have their origin in the same strength or weakness can only be answered when the problems are fully solved the immediate consequence of knowing that a child can usually be taught to read if he does other tasks well is of obvious import it would be of great service too to know whether lack of application can be corrected so as to bring concentration to the level of the other traits if a child is normal in other ways and not in his tendency to re respond to the approval of others by satisfaction can this drive be increased or reduced to the average or are individual differences in specific original tendencies basic to development of character and if they are how much influence do these differences exert upon school accomplishment in order to classify children and comprehendingly watch and control their progress we must know the relation of achievement to the inherited basis upon which it depends we must be able to state a child's progress in any one school subject in terms of the potential capacity of the child to progress we must know the inherited determinants of disparity in school product current experiments in reclassification in the last year reclassification in terms of scale tests both of mental ability and of subject matter has become an important issue in education the schoolman of america has accepted the verdict of experimental evidence his school has been convicted of heterogeneity and he has accommodated his thoughts on the subject of school organization to the idea of more rigid demarcation of groups of any one mental ability and even of any one stage of development in reading or arithmetic too often however the problem has been considered too simply as classification by mental ability by subject matter or by a composite of the two too often also mental ability alone or measurement of one product has been considered an index of mental elements not included in the diagnosis our results all indicate that for the present regrouping of children must be done both ways that each child has an ideal grade in each subject by virtue of the ability he has reached in that subject as well as an ideal section of that grade by virtue of intelligence that grouping of children must be done on two axes our results show further that if this is done all unevenness will disappear and each child's grade will become the same in each subject that all disparity in product will reduce to individual differences in mental ability but it is only by regrading for spelling and for arithmetic that the high correlation between different kinds of product is discovered since it is only in this way that remediable weaknesses are removed tests should throw light on the individual child measurement should form the basis for teacher's opinion it should neither supplant nor supplement it a surveyor does not use one instrument to judge distance and then accept its result irrespective of all other data such as known facts by the values investigated he makes another measurement when his results conflict with other data neither does he use his instruments and then compare the result with his opinion formed independently with the implied necessity of agreement he bases his opinion on the results includes such other data as he has and gets new facts until one interpretation explains all findings we should do the same not set up a test or a series of tests as the only criterion nor measure and judge independently and then check one series against the other we should use the test results as the very best data we have upon which to form our opinions and continue measurement until we know 
We rarely obtain a teacher's judgment before she has seen the tests, just because we hope that her judgment will be based on the results of the test. To do this, the results must be stated in terms of the individual child, since the average teacher, at her present stage of training, readily understands that two individuals in her class are far apart in accomplishment of any kind, but may not understand in any way directly applicable to her case and tribulations, that the variability of measurements of an ability in her class is great in comparison with that of other classes, or even that the overlapping of ability between classes is very great. Further, in order to gain her support, after we have shown the wide disparity in a class, we must proceed directly in terms of this demonstration to the reclassification. A method of survey of reading, language, and arithmetic. Instructions of which the following are a slight modification were outlined at Garden City, New York, in order to gain these advantages. 1. Administer and score the following tests according to standard instructions. Give all tests to all grades above 3. Woody McCall, Mixed Fundamentals, Form ITC, Bureau of Publications, Columbia University, New York. Alpha 2 Reading, Bureau of Publications, Columbia University, New York. Visual Vocabulary, Thorndike Reading Scale, A2 Series X, Bureau of Publications, Columbia University, New York. Kelly Trebu Completion Alpha, Bureau of Publications, Columbia University, New York. Stanford Binet, given by the author. 2. Translate the scores into year-month indices of maturity by means of the following table. Assume reticular development, that is, that the amount of score which equals a development of one month is the same as the amount of score which equals the development of any other month. Then interpolation and extension are allowable. Use a table in this way. Find in the table the score made by a child, for instance, in the Woody McCall. Find the age to which it corresponds, then call this age the arithmetic age of the child. For instance, if the score in Woody McCall is 20, his arithmetic age is about halfway between 10 and 11, or 10 years, 6 months. The table is displayed on the page with age, Woody McCall, Alpha 2, Visual Vocabulary, and Kelly Trebu. 3. Arrange these arithmetic ages of all the children of your school in order from high to low, with the names opposite the scores on the extreme left-hand column of the paper. At the right have parallel columns of the grades. Check the grade of each child in these columns. You will then have a sheet like this. A table is displayed with three columns, name, arithmetic age, and grade. And grade is divided between... 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. Do the same with each of these tests. It is clear that if your school were perfectly classified, all the 8th grade children would come first on each relation sheet, and then the 7th grade children, etc. You have now a picture of the overlapping of your grades. Divide your total number of children by the number of teachers available, and then make a class division by the number of pupils. That is, call the upper one-fifth of the total number of pupils grade 8 in this subject, the next one-fifth, grade 7, etc. If all grades of arithmetic are taught at the same time, and all grades of reading at the same time, you can now send each pupil to the grade in which he belongs in each subject. 4. Call each derived age a subject age, SA. Divide each subject age by the chronological age of the child. This will yield what may be called a subject quotient, SQ previously called the educational quotient, EQ. Dividing the reading age by the chronological age, you arrive at a reading quotient. This RQ is the rate at which the child has progressed in reading. We have the same kind of quotient for an intelligence, Stanford Binet IQ. This IQ is the potential rate of progress of the child. 5. The ratio of any subject age to mental age may be called a subject ratio, SR, previously called an accomplishment quotient, AQ. This subject ratio gives the proportion that the child has done in that subject of what he actually could have done, and is a mark of the efficiency of the education of the child in that subject to date. The goal is to bring these subject ratios as high as possible. When they are above 0 0.90, the child may be considered as receiving satisfactory treatment, providing norms for subject ages 
are reasonably accurate. This figure, 0 0.90, applies to a subject ratio obtained by using a Stanford Binet mental age. An arithmetic ratio based on one arithmetic test and one intelligence test only is not as good as one based on three arithmetic tests and three intelligence tests. If subject ratios go far over 1.0, the chances are that the mental age diagnosis is too low. The average of the subject ratios of a child may be called his accomplishment ratio. In all discussions and tables that follow, AQ means Woody McCall arithmetic age divided by chronological age, and AR means this AA divided by mental age. VQ means Thorndike vocabulary age divided by the chronological age, and VR means this VA divided by mental age. RQ means Alpha 2 reading age divided by chronological age, and RR means this RA divided by mental age. CQ means Kelly Tribu completion age divided by chronological age, and CR means this CA divided by mental age. SQ means any subject quotient, that is, any subject age divided by chronological age, and SR means any subject ratio, that is, any SA divided by mental age. EQ, the educational quotient, means the average of all subject quotients, the ACCR, the accomplishment ratio, means the average of all subject ratios. All R's are product moment correlation coefficients uncorrected. As reliabilities are almost what the other coefficients are in June 1920, it is apparent that the correct coefficients would all be very near unify at the same time. Accomplishment Tables 1 to 4 show what happened at Garden City as a result of this technique between November 1918 and June 1920. In tables presenting more of this in greater detail, for instance, the correlations between IQ and SQs with more cases and by grade, the same results are apparent. It will be seen by reference to Table 2 that the correlations between IQ and the subject quotients are appreciably higher for November 1919 and June 1920 than for the previous dates. Note also a remarkable increase in the correlation of IQ with AQ from November 1919 to June 1920. Reclassification is in my opinion responsible for about 90% of this increase in association between IQ and SQs. The reliability coefficient of each set of quotients is over 0.85. Table 4 shows further that not only was the correlation increased, but the absolute magnitudes of the SQs approached the IQs also. The quantity MIQ minus MSQ, which is a difference of averages, is mathematically the same as epsilon IQ minus SQ over N. The average of these differences this reduces towards zero. The same evidence as in presented there for arithmetic is apparent in the other subjects also. The neglect of genius. Table 5 gives the intercorrelations of subject ratios. Mental ability does not constitute an element in the child's score because a ratio expresses what proportion that, which a child has done, is of what he himself is able to do. A very brilliant child and a very stupid child both have the same chances to make a high or a low subject ratio depending upon the zeal with which they prosecute their school duties. The correlation of subject ratios, therefore, is an index of how far ability in one subject is associated with ability in another subject when intelligence is rendered constant. The tendency to association is about 0.5. See Table 5. At first sight, this would seem to indicate the operation of some general inherited factor other than intelligence some general proclivity which would influence children to invest a great proportion of their mental ability in one subject as another. Table 1 is displayed on the previous page. The group which took all tests at all periods arranged in order of magnitude of intelligence quotients, June 1920. It is also continued on the following page as well. Thus, when a child does good work in reading, he would tend to do good work in arithmetic. Good, meaning what his mental ability warrants. That might easily lead us to believe that children were endowed by original nature with different degrees of zeal, application, perseverance, or some such general factor other than intelligence. However, the accomplishment ratio, an average of subject ratios, correlates with intelligence quotients. 
to 0.61 in November 1918 and 0 0.49 in June 1920. In other words, the more stupid a child is, the more he tends to get out of education in proportion to his native ability. It is hard to conceive that such a relationship exists by original nature. It is easy for us to explain the negative correlation between zeal and intelligence in terms of training received in our schools, as they are now organised. This accounts fully for the intercorrelation of subject ratios, with no necessity to appeal to a concept of a general inherited factor other than intelligence. A child who is stupid has subject ratios, all of which are higher than those of a child who is bright. Hence a correlation exists between subject ratios. Table 2 is displayed on the following page. Intercorrelation of all quotients for all periods of the 48 children who took all tests at all periods. November 1918. The table is continued on the following page as well. Then the ratio of accomplishment to mental ability is in definite relation to brightness, a negative relation. It is this same tendency to adapt our educational procedure to a low level which has prevented a perfect association between mental ability and accomplishment in the various subjects. We are allowing the subnormal to be at the frontier of his abilities and are sacrificing the supernormal's chances in order to do it. And the normal children too, on a basis of this correlation, would seem to be getting less than they could if classification were added to our educational procedures. This serious maladjustment of conditions of education, this waste of nervous capacity, is unfortunate in an age when we are in great need of leaders, inventors, research scientists and artists. Table 4 is displayed on the page. Summary of progress in arithmetic by increase in RIQ minus AQ, decrease in MIQ minus MAQ, and decrease in difference of standard deviations. November 1919 to June 1920. We are neglecting the upper ocile more seriously than any other portion of the scale of brightness. Although it is rather through these than through a high average intelligence that civilization is advanced, the degree of adaptation of instruction to the individual is in inverse ratio to the degree of brightness of the individual. This is probably true of nearly all school systems. Table 5 is displayed on the following page, Intercorrelations of Subject Ratios. Our knowledge of existent school arrangements bears out the testimony gained at Garden City. Segregation of feeble-minded, special classes for the mentally deficient, special methods of teaching deviates, taught at normal schools, books on the psychology of the subnormal. All these are familiar, but there are a few provisions for similar emphasis upon the needs of those who deviate in the other direction from the mean. We are just beginning to pay attention to this group. There are just as much out of place in an ordinary classroom. There is one marked difference in results. Whereas we may, to some extent, combat criminal tendencies by special treatment of the subnormal, we shall increase our leaders by special treatment of the supernormal. This one is preventive, the other is provocative. The first reason seems the more potent. Preventive measures always seem more immediate to administrators, even though the debit value of the prevented catastrophe is much smaller than the credit value of an innovation which does not so much to correct any immediate trouble as to inaugurate new and fertile prospects. Wholesale real classification necessary. In all other details, the educational misfortunes of a curriculum and method not fitted to capacity are equal for both series of maladjustments. Whereas a subnormal child does not know what is going on and becomes restless, begins to cheat, troubles the teachers, and in some cases becomes openly rebellious, the supernormal child is bored and becomes restless and troublesome also, often developing a hatred and contempt of everything having to do with study. The one becomes sullen, the other conceited. The one tends to become an anarchist, the other peculiar. The one tempts criminal adventure, the other drifts into the life of a dilettante. They both tend to lose ambition, concentration and initiative, or because the methods of study and the curricula are not adapted to individual differences. The children of neither group are certain of developing the moral stamina necessary for good citizenship, nor do they form good habits of study or accumulate such information as they might. 
being aware of this discrepancy between the gift and the recipient we have made our lessons earlier and have segregated the lower percentile there is much more to be done we must adapt education to at least five varying classes in order to reduce the spread within each of the commodious span but the genius is the most important and consequently has the greatest claim to our immediate attention experiment and the current of educational opinion point to prophetic finger towards classification the experiment at garden city proves that the association between i q and subject quotients can be brought to almost unity and therefore that any amount of classification in terms of accomplishment in subject matter is not only justifiable but imperative in order to reduce all disparity in any one age group to these unremovable individual differences which may be expressed as iq a school which has been perfectly classified for two or three years will have groups all the same age and of the same potential rate of progress whose difficulties in arithmetic spelling and reading are of the same general level this will afford the opportunity for enrichment of the curriculum to the degree essential and will make unnecessary any rapid promotion each class can stay in each grade one year well one class will learn much there another will learn little because nature has been more generous in the neural endowment of the one than the other end of chapter four of intelligence tests and school reorganization chapter five of intelligence tests and school reorganization this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recorded by leon harvey chapter five the use of intelligence tests in the schools of a small city by c r tupper superintendent of schools miami arizona editor's introduction the author of this chapter would be the last to offer his experiment as in any sense a specific guide to others situated like himself it does contain the editor believes valuable suggestions of what may be done immediately by the superintendent of any small city in the improvement of school classification certainly it is unnecessary to wait until ideal methods of adjustment have been worked out the field is one in which widespread experimentation is desirable among various possible lines indeed only as a result of such experimentation can the best methods of reorganization be evolved the future trends of our educational development will be determined in no small degree by superintendents like mr tupper who have the initiative and courage to break away from the beaten path and to seek better ways of doing things lewis madison terman miami is a mining town of ten thousand population situated in the heart of the copper district of arizona the school system enrolls some one thousand five hundred pupils fifty per cent of whom are of mexican nationality an excessive retardation rate led to a systematic investigation to determine methods of cutting down this important human and financial waste the usual methods were first employed classes were reduced to thirty or thirty-five pupils the standards for teachers were raised so as to exclude all having less than two years professional training salaries were increased to attract the best teachers a bonus was offered to summer school attendants to encourage professional study the largest overage pupils were put in special classes the best of primary and special supervisors were secured a full-time attendance officer was employed and physical examinations were given to all children and many defects were remedied through treatment a specialist in pedagogical and intelligence tests was then sought and miss mildred thompson of stanford university was secured to inaugurate our program of diagnostic testing group intelligence tests were given to all children from the second to the eighth grades individual binet tests were applied to the first grades and to a large number of selected individuals the results of the tests were worked up in graphic form on large charts and colored inks so as to show mental and chronological ages together with iqs these charts then became the object of study in an effort to find the answer to what next from this study the following facts became evident one there was practically no real retardation the children who were chronologically retarded were in reality accelerated beyond their mental age in general those retarded the most chronologically 
were accelerated to the highest degree beyond their mental ability. 2. The extreme variations in mental age in the same class group were strikingly evident. One sixth grade group showing mental ages ranging from 8 years to 15. 3. This same wide range of mental ability was evident in classes in the same grade, suggesting at once the possibility of regrouping children without making it necessary to change their grade classification in the least. 4. Some few individuals stood out above their class so strikingly as to indicate the adversability of immediate investigations looking towards the skipping of a grade. 5. Many of the overage pupils showed a stage of mental development which at once indicated the uselessness of trying to force them through the regular course of study. 6. The class groups in one school with a 90% Mexican enrollment lagged consistently behind corresponding classes in the other schools in their stage of mental development. 7. Statistical investigation in elimination of pupils carried on simultaneously with the mental survey indicated the heavy mortality among these pupils, especially in the 5th and 6th grades. Still further study disclosed the fact that practically all these pupils dropped out of school one or two years before reaching high school. Several definite conclusions were at once deductible from these facts. It was evident that the wide mental age range in many of the classes made successful class work impossible and contributed directly to failures and retardation. The range of individual differences in some classes made them in reality ungraded groups rather than groups with a homogeneous mental development capable of profiting from class methods of instruction. The frequent inclusion in class groups of children with a mental development two or three years below the normal standard for the grade indicated that the work of the regular course of study was unsuited and unprofitable to them, and bore witness to the fact that many children had been promoted from grade to grade largely on the basis of chronological age alone. The consistent lagging of the Mexican groups behind other class groups indicated the necessity of a specialised curriculum for these children, especially since it was evident that scarcely any of them ever reached the high school. These facts having been established through the mentality survey of the schools, definite steps were taken to modify the school organisation along the lines indicated by the results. Care was taken to proceed slowly in order not to arouse the antagonism of teachers or school patrons through a radical introduction of new-fangled methods. The steps taken were as follows. 1. Two heterogeneous first-grade classes were regrouped on the basis of Binet tests, thereby reducing the mental age range from 4-10, i.e. 4 years 10 months, and 4-4 to 2-1 and 2-10 respectively. All children in one group were above 6 years mentally, all children in the other group were just 6 years mentally or below. Although in every case they were six or more years of age chronologically. The difference in school capacity between these two groups has been marked. The better group is making better than standard progress, and eleven of the pupils in it are now receiving special coaching for a skip. 2. Two 5B classes were regrouped partially on the basis of the results of the national intelligence tests and partially by teacher conferences and individual test results. Both groups contained 8-year mentality prior to the change, with median mentality of 9-0 and 9-1, and with mental age ranges of 4-5 and 3-10 respectively. Regrouping reduced the age ranges to 3-5 and 0-9, while the mental medians shifted to 9-10 and 8-3. One of the new groups was made up of mental ages ranging from 8 years to 8 years and 9 months. This later group is obviously not a fifth grade group. It still retains that name, however, in order not to discourage the pupils through demotion. The work of the class has been simplified to suit the group capacity. For these particular pupils, the class designation carries little significance, as they are hopelessly retarded chronologically and will drop out of school as soon as the legal age limit is reached. The IQ of this group ranges between 60 and 80 on the basis of the group tests, thereby indicating the improbability of any of them ever succeeding in high school should they attempt to enter. 3. A high 5th and a low 6th class were regrouped at the close of the semester into two 6th grade classes. In this case, the high 5th class evidenced a higher mental development than the low 6th. The best pupils from each group were placed together, and the slower pupils also were grouped. Both classes then went by the same name in order to avoid 
the discouragement caused by the demotion which really took place among the slower pupils prior to regrouping the mental age ranges were five three and three eleven with median mentalities of ten two for the high fifth and nine seven for the low sixth subsequent to regrouping the mental age ranges were reduced to one nine and two six while the median mentalities shifted to eleven two and nine one the lower group is now made up largely of overage pupils close to the compulsory age limit who will automatically drop out of school within a year or two they constitute a fairly homogeneous group which can be given work suited to their ability instead of being compelled to drag along in a group in which they are unable to compete successfully four two heterogeneous seven b groups were similarly reclassified Median mentalities prior to regrouping were 13.5 and 13.9, with mental age ranges of 5.7 and 5.2. Subsequent to regrouping, the medians shifted to 11.10 and 15.4, while the age ranges were reduced to 2.6 and 2.8, thus giving classes instead of mixed, ungraded groups. 5. Two 8B classes were regrouped in the same manner, thereby allowing the more advanced section to make up a half year of time six two high six classes were also regrouped with the result that the better class is saving a half year while the slower group is finding it difficult to finish the required work of the grade on time seven several individuals standing out from their classes on the group test were given special individual tests and allowed to skip grades eight two smith hughes classes for girls and two smith hughes classes for boys were selected and grouped through the use of binet tests in order to provide groups of pupils of as nearly equal development as possible nine results of the tests which showed the consistent lagging of the mexican groups behind other groups were considered in connection with elimination statistics for these pupils formed the basis for the action of the school board in deciding to equip the new mexican building with a view to emphasizing industrial and home-making causes for these children the superintendent was sent to other school systems in the state to observe methods and means of providing practical industrial and home-making training for Mexican classes. As a result, a definite program looking to the inclusion of this work in the Mexican schools was adopted by the board and will be provided for in the equipment of the new $125,000 Mexican building. All regroupings were initiated as a result of the intelligence tests, but in every case conferences were held with teachers before the final placing of pupils in no case was a pupil demoted as a result of the tests in spite of the fact that the results indicated that some pupils had been promoted considerably beyond their ability the aim throughout was the identification of pupils capable of making more rapid progress and formation of groups of pupils showing approximately the same stage of mental development the objective was continually the formation of real classes in place of the heterogeneous groups of pupils which are the inevitable result of haphazard grouping or grouping based solely on subjective teacher judgment the new groups showed a mental age range of less than three years in nearly all cases and should be able to profit far more by class methods than the old groups with age ranges as high as six to eight years were able to do the percentage of failures in these groups should be less since the range of competition has been narrowed and pupils are competing for success with other individuals possessing more nearly the same mental age level the retardation statistics for the system indicated that the work being offered in the schools was not adapted to many of the classes and to many of the individuals in those classes the intelligence survey demonstrated that the heterogeneity of the class groups with respect to mental development would not permit an efficient classroom teaching unless pupils were regrouped Regrouping on the basis of mental age is providing the necessary homogeneous classes, while a new course of study which lists minimal essentials, supplementary work, and suggested extensions, and which provides for special classes and special work in industrial and homemaking groups, is making possible the adjustment of the work to the ability and needs of the classes, which have been selected on the basis of mental capacity, whenever this could be done without demotions a selling campaign was put on subsequent to regrouping in order to make the program stick questionnaires were sent out to all teachers asking their opinion on the changes made and on the in general 
All papers were made anonymous in order to issue frank opinions and open criticism. The results were compiled and a general teacher's meeting called to consider the situation. It was shown by means of charts based on teachers' estimates of intelligence of certain classes that the subjective judgment is especially unreliable when used in connection with the estimation of the intellectual ability of children. This fact was still further emphasized by displaying large charts showing the results of well-known experiments on the ability of teachers in grading papers. The opinions of leading educators were quoted in order to acquaint teachers with the trend of expert opinion. An effort was made to impress the fact that the new method is not infallible, but that it is a decided improvement over older methods, is becoming more and more widely used, and that it is a part of every teacher's professional duty to become familiar with the nature, purpose, and use of tests. It was also emphasized that this method of grouping children aids the teacher in her work by providing a homogeneous group instead of an ungraded group with an excessive range of mental ability, and that the method affords slow children a much better chance to succeed by removing them from unfair competition with children possessing a far higher mental development. The public press was supplied with articles collected from various sources showing the advantages of the new method and the possibility of cutting down failures through its use, and thereby effecting a very considerable saving, both financial and human. Accounts of the work undertaken were sent to the superintendents of several of the western cities and to the educational authorities of various universities. A request was made for an expression of opinion in connection with the movement being introduced. The replies were published in the papers and formed the basis for still further explanations regarding the purpose and possibilities of the tests. The subject was also taken up before the town Rotary Club. All the changes made were explained and illustrated by the use of coloured charts. The advantages of the method over older methods were emphasised and expert opinion was quoted in support of the movement. The school board was constantly kept closely in touch with all plans and phases of the work. The advantages and possibilities of the method being continually emphasised and backed up through expert opinion. The result has been the definite adoption of the method and a steady support of its application by the school board, the teaching staff and a large majority of the community. It is confidently felt by the school admin that it will at last be possible to attack the retardation problem in the Miami schools on a scientific and fact basis. It is felt that the underlying causes have been located and the solution of the problem is well underway. The program adopted calls for a careful selection of groups of children with homogeneous mental development as determined by intelligence tests modified by teacher conferences. The diagnosis and standardization of these groups by the use of pedagogical tests and the application of a flexible and diversified course of study adapted to class groups. The formation of the course of study is well underway and is being rapidly carried forward by means of teacher committees in collaboration with highly trained supervisors. Special classes have been formed and more will be formed, but it is felt that the aim should be every class a special class, a homogeneous group of children personally conducted by the teacher on a tour through the system, accomplishing minimal essentials as defined in the course of study checking up on essentials through standardized tests, but always allowing wide leeway of supplementary work, as indicated by the personnel of the group. The aim seems to be dictated by the shifting nature of the school enrollment and by the wide diversity in ability, mental development, character, social position, and previous training of the cosmopolitan enrollment in the Miami schools. It is, of course, realized that practice will fall short of the aim, but it can be unquestionably shown that the indicated procedure is reducing and will still further reduce the percentage of failures and the percentage of retardation in the local schools. It can be conclusively shown that the indicated program is going far towards fitting the curriculum and the organization to the child in place of forcing the child to conform to the system or forcing him out entirely. It can be likewise demonstrated that the program offers opportunity to a large percentage of the children of the, in the Miami schools to secure a fundamental and functioning training in industrial and homemaking skill, which is denied to them under the traditional system. When it is recalled that the children of the Mexican laborers in the mines of the district almost invariably drop out after the sixth year to take up unskilled manual labor or to set up homes of their own, 
it will be readily appreciated that the schools owe it to these children to provide them with the definite training in this direction in place of condemning them to failure discouragement and early elimination by confining their school training to the traditional course of study looking toward high school entrance and graduation end of chapter five Chapter 6 of Intelligence Tests and School Reorganization, edited by Lewis Terman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 6, recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 6, Significance of Mental Tests in Corrective and Adjustment Cases. Report of Experimental Work with Poor Spellers and Non-Readers with Applications to Normal Children. Grace Fernald, Associate Professor of Psychology, University of California, Southern Branch. Editor's Introduction Work of the kind described in this chapter will always be of great importance, whatever plan is followed in the classification of children in general. Individual cases of maladjustment and of specific disability will always be with us. The editor knows of no one who has made more significant contributions to the better understanding and treatment of spelling and reading disabilities than Dr. Fernald. Unfortunately, she has published but little regarding the methods of diagnosis and treatment she has worked out as a result of several years of research in this field. It is to be hoped that this summary statement may be followed in the not too distant future by a more detailed account of the interesting experiments Dr. Fernald has made in this line. Lewis Medicine Terman the writer has for some time conducted investigations for the purpose of determining the characteristics of children of normal mentality who fail in specific school subjects or who show abnormalities in the learning process and for the purpose of discovering means by which the development of such children may be made normal only extreme cases of failure in specific school subjects were studied the initial work in the case of both reading and spelling consisted in a thorough mental and educational testing of each child if the educational tests verified the school report of failure and the mental test showed normal mentality further tests were given the child to discover if possible the reason for his failure each case was then followed up with instruction in the subject or subjects in which the child was failing finally class experiments were performed to determine whether the methods which worked with the child who had difficulty in a given subject could be applied to an ordinary class with satisfactory results experiments with poor spellers four hundred poor spellers have been studied during the last eight years a third of these were adults or high school students and the rest were children in the grades all were individuals of normal or superior mentality who were extremely poor spellers the main peculiarity found in the majority of these cases was lack of visual imagery in some cases the difficulty seemed to be that although the intention of these children had been called repeatedly to the visual image of the word they were unable to visualize that is the child had his attention called to what was at best a vague unstable image and so had no definite idea of the word as soon as the stimulus had been removed in other cases the child had been trying to learn words by saying the letters over repeatedly to himself the reason why this latter method of learning words is not favorable for the child whose imagery is primarily auditory or kinesthetic is given in the following paragraph it is obvious that the only image of the word as a whole which the non-visual child is able to get is either the auditory image of the word as pronounced or the lip or hand kinesthetic motor image of the word oral spelling which has been commonly supposed to benefit the child whose imagery is auditory or motor actually obliterates the only image of the word the child is able to get that is the child cannot pronounce the word to himself and at the same time say the letters of the word as soon as he begins to say the letters the image of the word as pronounced is lost in a few cases we found a child with visual imagery who was a poor speller in these cases the difficulty seemed to be lack of attention to the image the child was able to get clearly the children learned very rapidly as soon as attention was directed to the visual image the remedial treatment consisted one in eliminating oral spelling or any form of repeating letters while learning the word and two in having the child say each syllable to himself as he wrote it 
The child may have to say the letters in the case of non-phonetic words or parts of words. He soon develops the ability to size up a word and see at a glance whether he can write it as he pronounces it. It takes a little time and patience to get the poor speller out of his old habits and started on the process just described, but he requires no individual attention after the start is once made. In all cases in which the work was continued over a sufficiently long period, the spelling was entirely corrected. The length of time required seemed to depend on the extent to which the incorrect habits had been established. Children in their lower grades picked up the correct writing of words rapidly, and after a few writings of a word seemed to have no tendency to write it incorrectly. Older children and adults seemed to learn new words quite as rapidly as younger individuals, but showed a much greater tendency to revert to old erroneous habits. Attention to the word was necessary for a much longer period in the case of older students. This is, of course, what would be expected, as the more fixed a habit has become, the more the energy required to establish a substitute habit. Some of our most successful cases, however, were those of adults or high school children who discovered that they could write words correctly by the methods described, and who persisted until the new habits were established. The essentials for the correct spelling of a word seem to be 1. Correct perception of the word. The child must see the word and pronounce it. It is especially essential that the child have the visual stimulus of the word before him as long as necessary to form a clear image of every part of it. 2. Attention to the type of image a child can get most clearly. For the auditory child, this would mean saying the syllabus plainly to himself, except in the case of non-phonetic words, in which case it may be necessary to say the letters. 3. Writing the word while well, the image is clear in consciousness. The child may be able to write the word correctly if his attention is on the word, but quite unable to do so if he is thinking of something else. Consequently, it is necessary for him to think the word while he is writing it the first few times. 4. Writing the word correctly a sufficient number of times so that a habit is established. It is particularly essential that the child shall not be put in a position where he is compelled to write a word incorrectly during the habit-forming process. The rapid dictation of words of whose spelling the child is doubtful forces the child to write the word incorrectly and tends to establish habits of incorrect spelling. It is essential that the child should be able to go back to the perceptual process as often as necessary for the correct writing of the word. If he is allowed to look at the word whenever he is doubtful of its spelling but not allowed to copy it, the process of writing the word correctly will soon become automatic. It was found to be practically impossible to get poor spelling in the upper grades corrected unless teachers allowed the child to write as slowly as necessary in order to spell every word correctly. A few weeks under these conditions usually gave the desired results. Experiments with non-readers In a series of class experiments, it was found that the methods which proved effective with the poor speller could be used in general classes without interfering with the learning process of other children. The details of the plan for doing so are given in the Teacher's Manual of Spelling, California State Textbook Series. During the last five years, seven cases of non-readers have been brought to our attention. Only those children were considered non-readers who were normal according to mental tests and yet were unable to read monosyllabic words after at least three years in schools of good standing. In two cases, the children were unable to read or write their own names, although every effort had been made to teach them. The intelligence quotient in all these cases was over 90 by the Stanford revision, in three cases over 100, and in one case over 140. The chronological ages ranged from 9 to 12 years. Although only seven cases have been studied to date, the similarity in their behaviour suggests a common characteristic. All these children seem to be dependent on kinesthetic experiences for the development of word recognition. The failure to learn to read seems to be due to the absence of adequate motor expression in the beginning work in reading. The method used with these non-readers was the result of chance observations in connection with the work in spelling. One boy of eleven, who had been sent us from the first grade and who was unable to read or write monosyllabic words, finally learned to write several words after tracing them many times. It was found that he was able to recognise these few words in print. Other words were worked out in the same way with the same result. After six months, the boy was reading so easily that further special work was no longer necessary. He is now, after five years, doing good work in the eighth grade of the Los Angeles City Schools. 
The following method, worked out in connection with this first case, was successful in all six of the other cases. A word was written in Crayola on stiff paper. The child traced the word with his fingers as many times as he wished to do. He then wrote the word without looking at the copy. In all but two cases, it was necessary for the child to trace the first few words many times before he was able to write them. As soon as the child was able, he stopped tracing the word and wrote it after looking at the written word and saying it over to himself. Finally, he was able to learn the word from the printed copy and to recognize it after he had studied it without writing it. It was then given practice in the apperception of phrases and in silent reading. Each of these children has learned to read, all but one fluently after six months of special work, and all but the last two cases undertaken have gone into regular grades corresponding to their chronological ages. All are doing satisfactory work in these grades. The development seemed to take place in four distinct phases as follows. 1. It was necessary for the child to trace the word in script and write it before he was able to recognize it on later presentation. 2. He was able to write the word without tracing it, provided it was written and pronounced for him. 3. He was able to write the word after seeing it in print and having it pronounced for him. 4. He was finally able to recognize words without writing them, provided they were pronounced for him and to pronounce new words which resembled words he had already learned. Experiments with reading writing in the case of first grade children. The final series of experiments was made in connection with the first work in reading and writing in three different schools and followed the general plan of the work already described, except that no formal content was given to the child. From the start, the work was entirely spontaneous and individual and yet carried on with classes of the average size. The child began his writing work by asking for any word he wished to learn. The teacher wrote this word for him on cardboard with Crayola. The child traced the word as many times as he wished, and then wrote it on the blackboard without looking at the copy. After learning a few words in this way, the child began to write sentences, asking for any new words, and learning them by the method just described. Before the year was over, all the children were able to look at a new word, pronounce it and write it, tracing only in cases of especially difficult words. Their writing vocabularies were much more extensive than those of children in the second and third grades of the same school, and they tended to write much more complex compositions. Although a word was never copied, there was almost no misspelling. There were no failures of promotion in any of the classes in spite of the fact that one room was made up entirely of children who were unable to go into the regular first grade on account of some handicap, such as illness late registration, or supposed deficiency. In this case, a third of the children skipped at least half a year. Experiments of this kind have convinced the writer that the methods described for the treatment of poor spellers and non-readers have much to offer for the improvement of present-day methods of teaching normal children to read and spell. In closing, it is necessary to emphasize the value of mental and educational tests in the diagnosis of children's general and specific difficulties and in checking up the results of treatment. Without the use of test methods, such extreme individual variates as those here described are often likely to be misunderstood and our remedial measures are compelled to proceed largely in the dark. End of chapter 6 and the end of intelligence tests and school reorganization edited by Lewis Terman recorded by Leon Harvey